uh, with this 2021 drought, it presented an opportunity for historians to take a look at what is lying on the bottom of the Mississippi River from what we call the Brainerd Dam down to Buffalo Creek. Today we have Carl Faust here with us, and Carl is our resident historian and who walks the river on a regular basis and knows it like the back of his hand. Carl is well known in Brainerd for his history and also for his specific history on the river. He's an avid canoeist, so he knows the water very well. Thank you, Steve. Um, I would like to thank you for letting me see what the drone saw because when we were on hand and I was on hand three weeks ago, of course, we were down on the shores and we kept moving and we went from site to site. So it's going to be fun to point out some um, both navigational hazards and points of uh, historical interest as we move. And on the right, uh, you can see just a little spit of land there. That's uh, the area where the pulp mill was built uh, by the Weyerhaeuser folks in 1892. And that lasted until 1911. I just want to give you a little bit about this right and left business because um, if you were in a canoe, especially if you were going downstream, maybe you were heading from uh, Lake Itasca to New Orleans on what they call a source to sea journey, the river snakes around so much you simply can't use um, east and west or north and south. They only use the right side as you're going down a creek, as I call it, or on the left side. So no matter where the compass points, it's always right or left and upstream or downstream. Okay, the drone is uh, going to follow, for the most part, the main corridor of the river. Uh, in this particular view, there's an island and the drone will be on the left side and to the right is an area where they boomed logs so there's a lot of um, older logs probably never made it to market and a lot of pilings that they use to kind of corral the logs so we'll keep an eye on the, be the left side of the island but uh, uh, you'll see some uh, old vintage logs there as well and there are some pilings if you look closely and our next view is going to be on the left side of the river and I believe Steve and I were waiting for the drone to land, and that is off of what we call Cemetery Landing. Well, for, uh, obviously this was a big year for the river because the talk of town in Brainerd was, have you seen what's, what's popping up on the river bottom? And uh, so this is 2021. And as we look back, uh, could you talk about some of the years that that river was really low in your lifetime? Sure. I'll kind of go backwards in time. And I guess the lowest I can remember, uh, since I've been living on the river for 20 years or so, or had a lot out there, would be 2012. And that was that weird year where we had uh, uh, not spring flooding, but we had uh, unusually heavy uh, June rains. And it was near flood conditions. And then by September... October this time of year, it was uh, in near drought conditions again. So this year is actually about two or three inches lower than that. And then uh, we had a project where people would donate their scans of, of photos. And um, a guy by the name of Mike Powers brought in a picture that he took from the Laurel Street Bridge looking at the railroad bridge. And it was even lower than that. I'm thinking maybe even a foot. And so that was in 76. And then I know a guy that was just learning how to run his brownie camera there in about 75 he started working for a newspaper and he he confirmed that so the pictures that he got and this one taken from the he was on the riverbank uh, are kind of the benchmarks that we use and the usgs records don't go back that far so what i try to do is um, um, use the pier that i built a few years ago on my river river lot we're, we're down river from uh, the, where this video is going to end about a mile downstream from First Island, and I made some graduations on this pier, so I finally have something besides a port dock that doesn't have to go in and out or up or down, so I, I use that as a guide. So right now, uh, it's still low, although we've had some rains, and we are still about nine feet lower than we were this spring. Right about in the middle of the screen on the left side, you'll see what looks kind of like a sandy beach. That's actually the cemetery landing. And that little dot, um, you can't see it, but I can when I zoom in. Uh, that's uh, Steve and I, and I think I'm waving to the drone. And it later came down and landed in Jim's hand. Also at that cemetery landing, 
1914, they finally uh, traversed the huge ravine between um, Northeast Brainerd and Franklin School, and they also redirected the um, uh, ravine creek. It used to come off of about, or empty into the river at about 3rd Street, and instead they went right underneath the football field and made a direct shot right to the river. And about 40 feet of it has now collapsed into the river, and that too is somewhat of a navigational hazard. Uh, the next point of interest is right smack in the middle of the river and uh, when I first saw it by drone I thought sure that that was a uh, crib that they would use to you might say hook the islands together and if they didn't have an island they would make an island out of stones and and um, pilings but um, I later found out or heard from a friend of mine that he was out there one time and he thought there was a metal pipe going from that pile of rocks in the middle to the left shore. So yesterday I went down there and sure enough, I brought a probe down there and there is about a six inch pipe leading out to there. So I'm not, I'm thinking that is not a, um, uh, a boom chain, a boom chain piling. It is actually where the intake was for the, um, what, what would you call it? A, a pump house. So yeah. believe it or not, that's where we got our drinking water before we had wells and a water tower in 1920. So that pile of rocks is probably something that both holds it down and it might act as a filter. It might keep the debris out. To give you a little bit of perspective in this view here, take a look on the left side up on the bluff. I believe that is the first house uh, that is um, visible from the river on Bluff Avenue. Well, there is another um, photo that was in the dispatch, and that was taken of the 1932 Washington Street Bridge. And I believe that's even lower than that 1976 photo that was taken by um, Mr. Coles and by Mr. Powers in that low year. And I've often wondered, since these projects, such as bridge building, probably are planned years and years ahead, did they use that low, low year in 31 and 32 to actually say, okay, we've got, got it budgeted, we're not quite ready, but the, with the river, maybe it was 12 or 14 feet lower. At that time, this would be a good time to um, build the bridge. So maybe a little bit of uh, checking on the newspapers online. We may be able to ferret that out and find out uh, just why they decided to build that Washington Street Bridge in 1932. Well, one of the things, too, during that time was the what we call the Dirty Thirties. It was extremely dry, and um, men and women were out of work. And I had heard a story from an old-timer that men would line up on the site and wait to be called to work on that bridge. And if you were lucky, they'd call you. And if you weren't lucky, you would just stand there until you got tired of it and went home. I want to talk a little bit about these pilings. Um, just to give an idea how they made them, no doubt it was done in the winter when we had good ice and if they needed something for the spring, they would have to pound these pilings in naturally the small end of a spruce tree first, so like putting a pencil in, you wouldn't go eraser end first. So they bring a pile driver out there, put them in, make a great big rectangle, dump it all full of rocks. And after about 130 years, you can tell a piling from an ordinary deadhead because the branches are still visible. The 
piling may have reduced in size by about 30 percent, but the branches are still there and they're aiming down. So when you see a piling like that, that's what that's all about. But the interesting thing is, on the right side, all these pilings are about four feet taller than any of the other pilings downstream. And I can only guess that uh, when they put them in, it just happened to be a high water winter. You can see where the drone actually took the main part of the river, but if the drone had gone to the right where of all these pilings, that's where Whiskey Creek enters into the river. And speaking of high bluffs, if you look on the upper right, you can just barely make out one of the houses on Tyrol Hills, which was also about 60 feet high. The first bridge the drone encountered will be the Washington Street Bridge, and that was built in 1932, and it was built to connect uh, West Brainerd with Main Street, and of course it wasn't very much Main because uh, there was no way to cross the river there, and Front Street and Laurel Street were Main. When the bridge was put in, Main Street became Washington Street, On the right side of the river, directly under the Washington Street Bridge, that would be on the Tyrol Hills side, there are some pilings that are only viewable when it's this low, but those were likely from the ferry landing in the early 1870s. And just off of the left pier, I just found these this year, there are a couple pilings there too. So uh, strictly guesswork, but I think those were probably uh, a mooring point for the rope that went across the river at that, at that spot. That was one of the narrowest spots, and that's why the ferry landing wound, wound up there. On that four inch pipe, I of course viewed it uh, from like say the Laurel Street Bridge, but the drone was able to follow it kind of like I did with my eye when I saw about 10 feet of it out of the water. The drone followed it all the way across and it went right past that crib you can see on the right side, they're just not quite sticking out of the water. And there's um, some crescent shaped pilings there and I think that was probably an intake, so somewhat like that other uh, pile of rocks we saw in the center of the uh, river earlier. And that went up to a small pump house there and probably in the early 1870s that pumped the water from the river to the uh, steam engines. Moving downstream on the left side, uh, there are what I call the twin pipes, and they are 
about 20 feet long and they're hooked together with some kind of a bolt system. I have no clue what they were for. Um, they're kind of across from the athletic field. In fact, there's a parking lot below the high-rise parking lot and you can um, walk right down past the steamboat landing uh, historic marker there and walk out there about uh, 25 feet uh, when the water is this low. So if anybody has an idea why there would be two twin pipes going across the river to what looks like nowhere, we'd sure like more information on it. Speaking of the Washington Street Bridge, I may have mentioned earlier that um, Washington used to be called Main Street. Well, there was nothing much Main about it because all the businesses were put on Front Street. And then when the Laurel Street Bridge went in in 1882, of course, that became the Main Main Street. It just wasn't named as such. But it intrigues me that clear back in 1870 and 71, they decided the best place for the ferry landing was where the Washington Street Bridge is today. And if you look at an aerial map, you'll see why. It's quite a pinch point right there. So that was kind of probably destined clear back from 1871 to be the location of the main artery for, uh, east to west uh, in the city of Brainerd. Here comes the College Bridge. It's the only one that's uh, that low. I don't suppose we had to worry about uh, accommodating steamboats at this time. I think it was built in like the early 80s or so. But it is the only bridge that we have that actually has a pedestrian underpass under it. A lot of people don't know about that. It's a very, very busy highway between roundabouts there. And it's just before you get to Kiwanis Park. So it's also, as you can kind of see, uh, that is a quite a nice scenic overlook and a great fishing pier just beyond it. Another interesting thing, can you talk about the, uh, the time that the bridge collapsed? The, was it the Laurel Street Bridge? It was the railroad bridge, Steve, and that was in 1875. And unfortunately, it was an overloaded train going across a, an underbuilt bridge. Um, there were no concrete pilings. It was all just uh, timbers, uh, probably filled full of rock. And it was uh, westbound, so uh, it got halfway across and down it went. And the engine actually got as far... Um, as the West Bank and they claimed that that uh, made steam for hours and hours after it went down and sadly five souls were lost back there in 1875 and we did put a marker up for the sesquicentennial alluding to this uh, catastrophe. I'm going to ask you to be a, to speculate a little bit, okay? Sure. We know Brainerd is a railroad town, mm -hmm. okay? Um, could you imagine Brainerd without the Mississippi? Well, I think we probably would have been here because of our timber, but as we know, that lasted about 10 or 15 years. And of course, the river is still with us, and we've kind of forgot about it for about 100 years because it was no longer used for navigation. And the dam kind of took care of that as far as steamboats. So mm -hmm. you'll notice the college bridge no longer had to be 60 feet high. They could make a low bridge out of it. And uh, it just seems like there's a, a renewed interest in the river and me living on the river now, I see maybe several dozen folks that are doing the source to sea track down there. And I, I catch most of them. And then some of them, we have an organization, it's just a Facebook a group page called River Angels. And then you put your river location um, where you're at. I'm 999.3 and they GPS that. So if they have any problems or they need a, a bandage or something or they didn't have fresh water, they just... Uh, find out where the nearest river angel is and we have a, we put cross doors or paddles out front so they can find us so I'm seeing more and more of that all the time and then I have a friend down the river and he says I'm seeing more kayaks all the time he just can't believe it so finally I think we've realized that uh, it is a body of water you know it's not only navigable it's uh, swimmable in many places so I, I think the future is very bright after that hundred year hiatus Okay, we've left the College Bridge and we've gone into further downstream through Kiwanis Park. We passed the Dog Park and we're now into the new Rotary Park. And you can just see what I believe is a real navigational hazard. And what it is, is an old pipe it was abandoned in 1982. And that used to bring the sewage from the 
pump house that's um, just about a half a block away from that. And these weights are made of concrete and they actually were there to hold down the uh, plastic corrugated pipe. Over the years, they've moved about a bit. On the right side of the river, they just sort of disappeared. I don't know if they were removed or they're just that deep that you can't see them. How, how crowded was it on that river when they were booming the logs down and hanging them up on those islands? And then there had to be some boat traffic going through here. Well, I tell you, they, they say that the river is far cleaner now because it was basically a bunch of uh, logs and bark. And it, it was just a mess, and they tried their best to have navigation on one side. And um, from the dam down, the navigation was on the right side of the river, or what we call the west side. Uh, rather, the uh, lot booming was on the right side, and the navigation was on the left side. And then as soon as you got about to the later Washington Street Bridge, that was reversed because those logs had to find their way to Boom Lake, which was on the left side. So um, I'm sure it's a whole lot cleaner than it is now. And then speaking of cleaner, I've had a lot of people ask me about the orange colored, uh, it looks like foam or debris or whatever. I, I don't know if it's an algae bloom or, or whatever, but um, possibly somebody could help us out with that. I don't, I don't know what exactly you'd call it, but strangely enough, it, it started in the middle of the summer and it was quite orange. It was like some kind of an algae was dying. And as I'm getting closer here to fall, it seems like it's turning green again. So I don't know if it was something that was um, stunted and it's having a, a fall bloom or what. What sort of an apparatus did they have hooked up at Boom Lake to handle those logs? How, what kind of a machinery did they have to bring those logs in? That's a very good question. I wonder if they used a boom to boom the logs yeah. into Boom Lake. Yeah. Um, I think we do have a picture that was taken from what was later the ski jump. And that shows the entire area. We'd have to study that a little more carefully um, because I suppose there had to be a way to get them from the river, you know, into Boom Lake. And at times, uh, Boom Lake is higher than the river is, and it goes in the opposite direction. Right. So right. I guess that's going to require further study. And okay. I think after this video comes out, we're going to have years and years of study to be done. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So how many mills were on Boom Lake? Was it just one mill? I think it was one mill location. It was the Eber Bly Mill first. That was clear back in 1872. And then he later sold out, I believe, in the 1880s um, to um, oh, J.J. Howe. Okay. It was called J.J. Howe Lumber Company. And you can find a 1971 marker right in the uh, Kiwanis Park area by the swing sets. Not a whole lot to see moving downstream. Um, there is a pump distribution box there that has replaced the one that we just showed you with the, uh, those concrete weights. But that island on the map is called First Island. It, uh, the river makes an, uh, uh, 45 to the right heading downstream. And it's uh, commonly called Frenchy's Island because an old Frenchman lived out there uh, probably about 1900 to 1930. And then he uh, got to know uh, uh, Joe DeRozier, and Joe and his sister and families lived out there in the old Frenchman's um, cabin. And Joe's dad, Joe Sr., I believe it was, he actually built a suspension bridge, and there's just a little bit of a remnant of that uh, old cable out there maybe on the right side of that island. And just beyond that is uh, South Brainerd. I'd like to thank everyone for watching this video and thank the videographer, uh, Jim and um, Steve here for allowing us to do this. It's, it is a rare opportunity. It only comes around about maybe eight or 10 years. But since this, um, the Riverfront Committee has done a, a river cleanup and we filled over half of a nine yard dumpster full of stuff, mostly junk, a few artifacts that we are gonna study all winter. 
and maybe this will be kind of the beginning of the we have a river here in Brainerd and there's a lot of interest in it and it's uh, it is navigable and quite beautiful thanks